Good morning, everyone. It's great to be able to worship the Lord together uh, wherever and whenever you're watching this today or maybe through the week. Uh, this is maybe the last uh, different thing, uh, online service that we'll be doing. Our plan is that next week we'll be uploading a recording of the service that we'll be doing live today in the church. Hopefully that makes sense to you. But we're going to continue to worship the Lord today as we continue to look through Mark's gospel and continue on and finish the end of chapter 7. But today I want to continue just using uh, uh, the Valley of Vision, uh, this book of Puritan prayers, to help us to pray in a way that's maybe a little bit different uh, to the way that we normally do. And so the, the prayer today as has been used by Christians down through the years is called spiritual helps. And so as we come to the Lord, let's join our hearts together as we pray. Eternal Father, it is amazing love that you have sent your son to suffer in my stead, that you have added the spirit to teach comfort and guide that you allow the ministry of angels to wall me around permit your unseen servants to be ever active on my behalf and to rejoice when grace expands in me suffer them never to rest until my conflict with sin is over and i stand victorious on salvation's shore. Grant that my proneness to evil, my deadness to good, my resistance to your spirit's motions may never provoke you to abandon me. May my hard heart awake your pity and not your wrath. And if the enemy gets an advantage through my corruption, let it be seen that heaven is mightier than hell. That those for me are greater than those who are against me. Arise to my help in richness of your covenant blessings. Keep me feeding in the pastures of your strengthening word. Searching the scriptures to find you there. If my waywardness is visited with punishment or problems, enable, enable me to receive correction meekly, to bless the reproving hand, to discern the motive of rebuke, to respond promptly, and to do the first work of love. Let all your fatherly dealings make me a partaker of your holiness. Grant that in every fall, I may sink lower on my knees and that when I rise it may be to loftier heights of devotion. May every cross be sanctified, every loss be gain, every denial a spiritual advantage, every dark day a light of the Holy Spirit, every night of trial a song. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen.
Our scripture reading today is from Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. This is the word of the Lord. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Epaphatha, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened. His tongue was loosed and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Amen. And we thank God for his word to us. What would it be like to not be able to hear? You know, I love listening to things. I have what I assume must be a very annoying quirk that I have to fall asleep listening to something. And, and I think it really does annoy Caroline from time to time because I fall asleep listening uh, for a time to Ricky Gervais' podcast and they would kind of be on repeat. And so I slept soundly listening to these podcasts and I would fall asleep but Caroline would wake up in the middle of the night to the sound of Ricky Gervais's really annoying laugh. I'm a listener. I can't imagine what it would be like to be deaf, to not be able to hear someone say I love you, to hear the wind rustle through the trees or the rain battering on the window, to hear laughter, or to share in a joke. It's amazing to think that even one of the greatest composers of all time, music is such a wonderful thing. Beethoven started to lose his hearing age 26 and was completely deaf, deaf before he wrote his, his greatest works. But what about not just being unable to hear? What about losing your speech? Not only can you not hear what people say, but you can't say anything to them. Not able to share your own thoughts and words. To have the frustration of never having your opinion listened to. To join in a conversation that people are having. To bring a word that brightens up someone's face. You know, here in this part of Mark, we have another outsider. A man who's not just deaf, but mute. He cannot hear and he cannot speak. And notice again where Jesus is. He's in the Decapolis. That's an area that we've thought about before. It's a pagan area of Israel where Jesus has healed a man oppressed by that demon legion. And here is another man, another outsider to the kingdom. Not just because he's a pagan, but think about this. How can this man ever receive the good news that Jesus is proclaiming in words? If he can't hear and he can't speak, is it possible for a deaf and mute pagan man to enter into Christ's kingdom? Is there someone so on the outside because of physical disabilities that they can never be on the inside? Are they trapped and lost because they cannot hear and respond to the good news that's being proclaimed? You know, we're to see in this part of Mark that no one is outside of Christ's kingdom call. No disability is a barrier to the one who speaks to us in our weaknesses and who does all things well. 
So I want you to notice in this story how Jesus deals with this man. The first thing I want you to notice in verse 32 that you, is that you'll see that this deaf and mute man is brought to Jesus by one excited crowd who want to see a miracle. It's, it's a they that bring this man to Jesus. And it begs the question, does this man who's deaf and mute actually want to be there? Does he know what's even going on? We don't have any mention that he wants to be healed or that he's taken any initiative. Even if he had wanted to go and see Jesus, would he have had the ability to communicate to Jesus? This man is at the mercy of the crowd, whether he wanted to see Jesus or not. In God's providence, in God's way of working things out, he ends up at Jesus' feet whether he wants to be there or not. But why are the crowd there? The crowd seem to want to show. They want to see Jesus put his hands on this man. You'll see there in the verse that they begged Jesus, pestered, pressurised, pushed Jesus to lay his hands on this man, to visibly put his hands on this man so that they could see a miracle. And it begs the question, was this crowd really after Jesus to listen to Jesus? Or did they want the healing show? Either way, look how Jesus responds. Because he isn't interested in being a crowd pleaser. He isn't interested in big shows displaying his power for people to get a kick out of it. He isn't interested in entertaining the crowd. He's interested in saving a soul. And so look what he does. Jesus is humbly private. Look at the start of verse 33. What does he do with the deaf and mute man? He takes him aside privately away from the crowd. I think right here is a part of the passage that we might normally just glance right past. But it's important. Jesus, like I've just said, he isn't in so interested in public spectacles as we are. You know, the biggest public spectacle that Jesus ever makes of himself was his death on a cross. Even his most public display of, is one of gory, glorious humility. Jesus does the greatest transaction ever in human souls in humble privacy. That is what Jesus is interested in. And so it's important for us to know as believers, it's so important for us to know this as believers because so often we want a big outward show. We love the idea of a good gospel service with an altar call at the end where people stick up their hands and come to the front to receive Jesus as their saviour. Now, I, I'm not trying to bash that kind of thing. I don't want you to mishear me. But I do want to say this, is that often we're like the crowd. We get a thrill out of watching Jesus do something miraculous. We get a buzz out of how many people come forward or have prayed the prayer or have seen, we've seen the results of Jesus do something. Albeit that we can have good intentions, but possibly it's mixed up with this, a bit of a sinful desire for that buzz of wanting to see God's power on display. But here I think is a first simple lesson that we can take from this passage. Jesus is always doing his work in the humble privacy of people's hearts. Jesus is always slowly doing a work behind the scenes, speaking to souls in the privacy of their hearts and that's a natural, gracious way that he works. It's been my experience that most people come to Christ by his private speaking into their lives. Not in an altar call or some kind of stick up your hands and come to the front moment. And so today, if you're watching this, I want you to understand that you don't need me as a, medi a mediator to bring you to Christ. If he's speaking to you today, as in you know you're a sinner who needs Jesus to be your saviour, 
That's him speaking to you. And you can pray to him to ask him to be your saviour, to become part of his church, to become part of his people in that humble privacy of wherever you are. Because that's how Christ works. Christ Jesus comes to save and his salvation is between you and him. It isn't for the crowd show. So that's the first thing that we see here. Jesus takes this deaf mute man aside to deal with him in private humility away from the crowd's humble privacy. Secondly, the thing I want you to see and how Jesus deals with this man is that he deals it with him, not just with that, that humble privacy, but in a way that's humanly personal. Notice as, as verse 33 goes on, that Jesus communicates to this man in a way that this man can understand. You know, we can come to a passage like this and think that what Jesus is doing is really strange. He's sticking his fingers in this guy's ears and he spat or put his spit on this guy's tongue and he's looked up to heaven. That looks a little bit strange. And we might think, what in the world is going on? We know that Jesus can heal without even having to touch a person. In fact, we learned that in the last story where the, the Syrophoenician woman's daughter was made well just by Jesus saying, even when he was nowhere near her. And yet here, Jesus does something that really looks to us weird, if not downright disgusting. Can you imagine if you were lying in a hospital bed and I came along as your minister and said, hold on a second here. I'm going to fix you right up. I'm going to make you well. So what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to stick my fingers in your ear holes. And I want you just to open your mouth there and I'm just going to spit into it a little bit here and you'll be, you'll be made well. If I came into that in your bedside, you'd be freaking out. You'd probably want to whack me around the side of the head. So what's different about this situation? Well, I want you to see that Jesus is communicating to this man on his level and in a way that he can understand. Jesus is using very basic sign language. I want you to imagine the scene from the point of view of a deaf mute man. You look into the face of this man who is God and you see him take his hands and communicate to you by putting his fingers in your ears, as if to say this, I understand that you are deaf. And as he looks at you again, he reaches towards his own mouth and he wets the tips of his fingers with his tongue. And then he moves his finger towards your mouth, as if to say, I understand that you're mute. And again, as he looks to you and you look at him, he lifts his eye contact from you and towards heaven. And he sighs. He, he has a movement in his body to indicate physically as he looks towards heaven. As if to say, now the Lord God of heaven, because I have asked, will open your ears and your mouth. And he says, be open. Suddenly in that moment, your ears are opened to the sound and the voice of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This man's tongue is loose and he begins to speak as if he never had a problem. That's an amazing, amazing sight. To see Jesus communicate to a man on his level in a way that he can understand. Jesus has healed this man in a way that's so humanly personal to this guy so that this man would understand and know from his own deaf and mute position what Jesus is doing in that moment for him. Jesus graciously condescends to talk to this man in his condition in a way that he can understand. And so I think this is the second lesson that we should take away from this. Jesus has never ceased to continue to speak in a way to people in the world the good news in a way that they can understand. 
He has the ability to speak to hearts beyond what we think is achievable. Jesus condescends to speak to the heart of the hearer that no disability can block. And there's so many practical lessons for us in that. God speaks his word to his people by his spirit in a way that they can hear and understand. Even when we think there is no way from a human perspective that they can understand and respond. Can Christ's good news reach those who haven't got intellectual, intellectual ability to articulate, uh, articulate their faith in all the evangelical language that we use? The answer is yes. Can Christ's good news reach those who haven't got an ability to speak and make an audible confession of their faith? The answer is yes. Jesus condescends to speak to the hearts of the hearers. And I have loved having the chance to be involved in all kinds of disabled ministry. And every time I do and I'm involved in that, I'm amazed how the simplicity of the gospel news of Jesus is received with such joy. Many have a faith in Christ that burns brighter than mine, regardless of a capacity to express it in language that I would use. And a story like this reminds us that Jesus is humanly personal. He's the one who, who takes the word that we proclaim about him and, and lets a soul understand it beyond what we think is possible. You know, if my preaching has ever moved you, let me tell you, it isn't about me being able to speak eloquently or well or use illustrations. Christ speaks in his word and all I ever try to do is lay it open before you. And the one who makes the deaf and the mute hear and speak is the same one who speaks into our hearts. And he opens up his kingdom that he might bring all inside. He does it in humble privacy and he does it in a way that's humanly personal. Jesus does all things well. At the end of this story, the people can't help but speak about Jesus, about the fact that he does all things well. And the only other little thing I want to say about this passage is that there's a little word used of this mute man. And it's a word that only occurs one other place in scripture. And it's in Isaiah. When Isaiah speaks of a day when the Lord will come and the deaf will hear and the mute will speak and they will speak about God's salvation. That's what's happening right here. The people cannot help but speak about God's salvation and about that kingdom. You know, we get to be partners in sharing God's word. We get the joy of seeing him work quietly and personally in the lives of those who hear the message we proclaim. And those people find life in his name. It's not about how well we can articulate that word. Because it's Jesus who is involved in speaking privately and humbly humanly, personally, into the hearts of hearers. Be encouraged as you share his word, that Jesus is at work in his word and will bring many outsiders into his kingdom as insiders forever.
Christ deals with us all in many different ways. He deals with us in that humble privacy and that way that's humanly personal. I pray you might know Christ's voice by his spirit working in his word, speaking to you today, that you might have greater trust in the Saviour who calls us each by name. And so as we close, let me lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you're the personal God, the one who speaks to every heart and every soul in a way that we can understand and know your grace in the Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray today that all who hear your word across the face of the earth might hear and know that you are God and there is no other, that there is no other name by which men can be saved, but by the name of Jesus, who is both Saviour and Lord. And so we pray today that grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit would go with us and be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.